Yes. Okay, so the, the next speaker is Dominique Zumbub from Basel. Um, welcome, Dominique. All right, thank you very much for the introduction and I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation. It's great to be here and to give a talk. So my talk will be actually in two parts. First part, I will try to introduce to you a method to actually probe and study edge states in uh, various systems. And in the second part, I'll talk a little bit about our recent experiments on graphene nanoribbons and our attempts to make uh, ribbons with zigzag termination. But I'll start first with the edge state spectroscopy. This work was recently published in, in Nature Communications and there is two more manuscripts uh, in progress and uh, here are my collaborators. I'll just show that very quickly and the funding. So in, in one dimension you get conductance quantization. This is well known and there is a factor of two which comes from the spin degeneracy. So if you're looking at, for example, a semiconductor uh, one-dimensional system, for example, in gallium arsenide, uh, if you have one transverse mode, you expect to get 2e squared over h. This is Landauer quantization. It's been long observed many years ago. And recently, about 10 years ago, we looked at the conductance of a wire, which is a few microns long in these cleaved edge overgrowth samples. And we found, interestingly, that at high temperatures, this is above 10 Kelvin, the conductance is as expected 2e squared over h, but as we cool the system down below, down to 100 millikelvins into lower temperatures, actually this conductance of the first mode drops and approaches 1e squared over h at around 100 millikelvin and then doesn't change anymore for lower temperatures. So somehow, as we're lowering temperature, this spin degeneracy is lifted and is broken and it goes to 1 uh, spin selective mode. So in this, in this paper we go through a number of possible explanations but the only explanations which we cannot rule out is a kind of situation where the nuclear spin system orders into a helix and this actually creates a partially gapped state where uh, one of the spin modes is, is not transmitted anymore. There's a theory that goes along with this, which was a few years before that, and the ordering temperatures are quite high, and these high ordering temperatures in this particular case were motivated by a strongly interacting 1D system in the Luttinger liquid. So I'll, I'll skip through this explanation slides, but basically motivated by this, we set out to study uh, the dispersions of this wire in more detail and in particular we wanted to see the partial spin gaps which were predicted by this theory. And in process of this we actually discovered a very powerful tool which I believe can be used quite generally not only in gallium arsenide but also in 2D materials to look at uh, edge states, how they form and how they uh, develop. So I'll show you how we can use this kind of tunneling spectroscopy, which I'll introduce to get kind of nanometer resolution on the position of the edge states. And, and we can use this to study many interesting properties of, of such edge states. So uh, this technique I will show you, it has very high resolution. It works from very low magnetic field all the way to many Tesla. And it's uh, very weakly invasive and it works at low temperatures all the way up to high temperatures. So it's quite versatile. So the sample that we looked at is a, a double well, gallium arsenide quantum well. So here it's kind of schematically shown. It's cleaved inside the high vacuum chamber and then it's overgrown with another modulation doping sequence. These samples are all uh, grown by Lorem Pfeiffer and co-workers and uh, have been used to demonstrate many Luttinger liquid properties in, in earlier experiments. But here we basically use it with a top gate which we bias negatively to deplete the two deck underneath to separate this uh, into two systems. Only the lower uh, well is not populated, only the upper well has uh, carriers and so if we want to drive a current through the system we have to use an ohmic contact which starts let's say on one side couples to this uh, wire, then there is some tunneling, it goes through the lower wire, it tunnels back up to the upper wire and goes into the 2D system and creates a current, which is what we're going to measure. So um, for this experiment, <coughs> actually, we're going to look at zero bias measurements only for the most part, and this means that we have to overlap 
the uh, Fermi point of, of the lower wire with the Fermi point of the upper wire. So the way we do this is we use a magnetic field which is applied in a direction which is perpendicular to the two wires. So there's a plane that's uh, spanned by the two wires and perpendicular to that we apply a magnetic field. And with this magnetic field here, these are the two wires, a perpendicular field, we basically give a momentum kick to the wire as it's tunneling. And this momentum kick will actually here depend on both the strength of the magnetic field as well as the separation in space between these two wires. And so we can actually control the momentum axis um, of this uh, tunneling measurement by controlling the magnetic field. And so here if we do this, it turns out that zero field, there's a little bit uh, uh, higher density in the upper wire, but if we apply some small magnetic field, we can actually overlap these Fermi points and as a consequence of that, that current goes up. So this shows the tunneling conductance, which is proportional to the current as a function of this magnetic field, and that's some field which corresponds to this overlaying Fermi points, we get a peak in conductance, okay? Now we can repeat this measurement not only as a function of the magnetic field in the Y direction, which is this direction perpendicular to the plane spanned by the two wires, but we can also apply a magnetic field that's perpendicular to the 2D plane of the quantum well. And uh, this field will be very interesting, actually, if we look at these uh, data as a function of both BZ and BY here, then we see this very rich structure in modes, and I will spend the next few minutes explaining a few of these features that we see here. So essentially, these uh, two very straight peaks, so here the data was aligned to have a uh, the small component of the uh, Y field cancelled in the Z direction. There is always some small misalignment uh, of a few degrees and here the data was uh, kind of rotated uh, to have uh, Z equals zero on the vertical axis here. So, so these two horizontal lines are this 1D, 1D tunneling from the upper wire lowest mode to a, a mo mode in the lower wire. And these other features actually I will show you correspond to kind of Landau fans when tunneling to some of the modes of the lower wire. So if we have two magnetic fields, not only this one I started with, but also one in the Z direction, then this gives an additional component here to the momentum kick, which is still along the direction of the wires. And in this way we can explain each of these fans, for example this one, uh, corresponds to tunneling to the different Landau levels uh, when tunneling to the second mode in the lower wire. This one down there is the, the third mode, actually the ground state mode, and, the, and there's another one that will corresponds to the third mode. So these are copies of basically the uh, quantum Hall states in, in the upper quantum well. So this shows uh, a larger section of this type of data again as a function of by and bz as before and if we take some derivative of this actually we start to see many interesting features which we can follow in position. And so here these are labeled, these are the different lambda levels, uh, red is shown tunneling to the uh, lowest mode in the lower wire, then the second mode and the third mode. So we get a few copies of these different Landau fans. So what we can do now is we can analyze this situation and as a consequence of the anal analysis from the position in magnetic field we will be able to uh, conclude where is the center of mass of these edge states in space. So we can kind of map them in space by mapping them in magnetic field which is kind of a powerful tool to actually look at where these edge states are sitting. So we just write down the Schrodinger equation in Landau gauge and we get here these guiding center positions Y naught which are uh, coupled to the magnetic length times Kx, uh, magnetic length squared which is defined in its usual way as the square root of uh, basically one over the field in the Z direction. And so then we add a hard wall potential and in this case the hard wall is well justified because due to the cleaved edge overgrowth uh, which gives a very sharp uh, kind of uh, well-defined plane, we get a very sharp potential. So here we take basically an infinite uh, potential step and plug this in and we solve this. Uh, we can solve it numerically or analytically, both works very well. And as the guiding center is approaching the edge of the sample, which is this hard wall shown here, then these levels start to rise up because the confinement effectively becomes more tight and these uh, levels rise up in energy and we get these uh, uh, energy, the, the Landau level energies as a function of guiding center position. And so with this now, 
And coupling this to the position in space via the magnetic field, we can now look at the spectroscopy if we draw this dispersion of the lower wire, which we just take as a simple parabolic dispersion. We can now start to get signals when we match the Fermi point of the lower wire mode with uh, a position of these lambda levels. So for example, if we shift it by using the, the B magnetic field the in, in the perpendicular direction to the two wires, we get th this lambda level, we can shift it into any of these positions, that's when we get current, for example, here for this fixed magnetic field in the Z direction. And then one can repeat this for different fields in the Z direction. So this allows us basically to plot all of these different uh, mode tunnelings, so the first, second and third mode in the lo lo lower wire, and get actually a very good agreement between the theoretical positions that we calculate from this simple uh, single particle picture and this uh, positions. So the picture that we draw is actually very much what one would expect. So starting from very low magnetic fields, going to higher fields, this is kind of a nonlinear scale, but I've picked it in such a way to kind of illustrate the, the physical picture of how these edge states evolve. So we increase the magnetic field at first, at low field, when the magnetic field is very, when the magnetic length is very long, then these edge states are not very well compressed against the edge. They kind of extend far into the bulk. As the field gets larger and larger, they get pushed more against the edge until finally at the larger fields, the um, uh, edge state starts to get magnetically depopulated and it moves into the bulk as it's doing that. So that's this very end of the evolution when it basically gets depopulated. So that's what we would expect. And what we see here nicely, this, this corresponds to the simulation that I was shown, is that there is a strong separation of the guiding center and the center of mass of the wave function. Of course, the center of mass of the wave function has to stay inside the sample, so it's always here. First it's approaching the edge, then it's moving back inside, while the, the guiding center is far outside the sample first, and then it's merging with the center of mass at higher fields. So let me point out a couple of other things we can do. We can do actually self-consistent simulations of these states at the edge, and uh, look at what these wave functions look like, and in addition to calculating and, and using the positions to get the information on the of the edge states, we can also look at the intensities by looking at the overlap uh, of the lower wire mode with the uh, edge state wave functions in the upper well. And so this is a kind of uh, using the simple situ s simulations to look also at the at intensities. So this is the experiment here on the right side, and you see here the lowest lambda level is kind of bright and it gets dimmer as we go to higher lambda levels, and we are able to reproduce this effect with the simulations. Similarly, for tunneling to wire mode 3, of course, the third mode will have a different spatial distribution and so will result in different intensities also in the spectroscopy. In fact, here uh, in the experiment, this uh, at, at low field here, the modes are not really visible and then become more visible as we go to higher fields. And that's also what we can reproduce. So this has to do with nearly orthogonal wave functions at low fields and then as they get compressed, they lose this orthogonality. So this also gives quite good agreement. And finally, as a last part of this section of the talk, we see many other interesting effects. For example, if we're following some of these curves here, they're not actually uh, very simple, but they have a kind of step-like feature on it. If we zoom in here, you see here that this uh, works its way up here in field in kind of steps. And this we can explain with the pinning of the Fermi level inside the lambda levels as we're going through the, the range of the magnetic field. So there's some uh, disordered broadening, as always, in, in these 2D materials, and this kind of defines this oscillating uh, level, which gives these steps. Also, at high magnetic fields, here at the uh, highest range uh, above 4 Tesla, we see how all of these single lines split into double lines, and we interpret this as a spin splitting, which we can also resolve here, and that's very interesting. We can actually calculate effective g-factors, and we find here very strong exchange enhancement of these g-factors uh, if we look at this and analyze it. <coughs> Finally, uh, if we look at some of these lines, it's interesting to point out that actually using these magnetic fields, spectroscopy, we get very good spatial resolution. So to give you the conversion, I've drawn here this green arrow, uh, which actually corresponds to about 10 nanometers in space. Uh, 
So the resolution that we get by this broadening of these peaks is kind of sub 10 nanometers and we get pretty good position information on these edge states. Also in some regime, when the edge states are nearly depleting, so here we have a case where this edge state is developing and then around here it moves into the bulk and it's gone and we can no longer observe it. But just before it does that, here is a zoom in. We see how this uh, feature here first splits into two lines and then splits into many lines before it disappears and is no longer detectable as the edge state is depleted. So this, we're not quite sure what this is, but our interpretation would be that this has to do with kind of edge state reconstruction. So as the edge state is moving away from the wall into the bulk, the effects of the confinement become very weak, which is the regime when the exchange effects, interaction effects due to electron-electron interactions can become very strong and can lead to the reconstruction and breaking up into multiple edge states of, of this particular state. Uh, we can also measure the edge state velocities and, and map these over large ranges. So that's also very interesting for, for studying these, but I don't really have time to go through this. I would like to skip this actually and kind of put my conclusions for this first part of the talk. Uh, yes. Uh, sorry. Um, so this is splitting uh, near the depletion is. Uh, this is something related to the fractional quantum Hall effect, could it be? Uh, no, I don't think so. So what we're following here is uh, maybe lambda level, the second lambda level, lambda level one uh, of, of one of these fans, and it's just the usual integer quantum Hall uh, state. But in principle, uh, this technique could be used to also study fractional effects. We haven't quite gone to a high enough field here, in this experiment, but we're planning to do this in the future. I think in principle one could also study the fractional states, or, or any edge state for that matter. Thanks. Also, so um, let me just conclude here by saying that we have kind of developed here a, a tunneling spectroscopy method to study edge states. And I would imagine that, for example, one could go away from this material that we've done here, but do it, for example, with graphene by putting some kind of nanowire on top of, of some graphene edge and then looking at tunneling between this nanowire and the graphene to look at the edge states, for example, in the graphene. This would also be possible. Or one could put some topological insulator and put the nanowire on top. The requirements on this nanowire is not that it's ballistic. I mean, these wires are very clean in this gallium arsenide system, but it's not, not necessary for, for this to work to actually have ballistic nanowires. Some usual uh, indium arsenide or indium antimonide nanowires could actually also do this job. I'd also like to point out that recently, uh, since my lab started about 15 years ago, we started ma building many electronics tools which we use in many of these experiments and we started a spin-off about a year and a half ago, which uh, is now uh, commercializing many of these instruments, including voltage sources, uh, IV converters, and voltage preamps, which are particularly uh, geared towards these types of experiments. So these are specializing in very low voltage noise, very low current noise, and highly stable uh, instruments. So I set up a table outside if you'd like to take a look at these. So let me switch to the second part of my talk which is in a second set of slides here. And so in this talk, I would like to present to you uh, our experiments towards forming graphene nanoribbons. And I'd like to again acknowledge a number of collaborators which made this research possible, as well as two papers where all of this is published, one in 2017 and one just earlier this year in Carbon in 2019. So graphene nanoribbons are a very interesting system because a number of uh, interesting uh, physical states were predicted. For example, in a zigzag ribbon, there could be spin filtering. This was uh, proposed uh, many years ago. In armchair ribbons, uh, there were proposals for forming spin qubits that were mentioned earlier, but also Majorana fermions. If you pattern these kind of alternating nanomagnets to induce some kind of uh, artificial spin orbit coupling, then Klinovayan laws here predicted one could form Majorana fermions. So for all of these uh, proposals, or for many of these anyway, it's, it's crucially important that one has very good edge termination of these nanoribbons. So there's a number of techniques. For example, there's bottom-up synthesis 
by the MPAR group, which published both zigzag and armchair ribbons. But these are very short and actually uh, on, a, on a substrate, which is uh, basically conducting metallically. So it's not easy to do then transport experiments on them because it couples to the substrate. So one technique, which I will present here a little bit, is uh, etching in a remote plasma. So that's what we introduced in this uh, uh, 2D materials and applications paper in 2017. Um, basically, let me skip through this. There's many different ways. In this technique, we create the hydrogen plasma, which we flow in, in a, in a uh, CVD furnace. And uh, basically, we place the sample downstream out of uh, the uh, active region of the plasma. So basically, this glowing region has many ions, and it basically, let's say, destroys the sample or creates very strong etching. But we put the sample here in the regime, as indicated by these positions, where the ions are all recombined, but we still have a significant amount of fraction of radicals, so hydrogen atoms, which, which can actually still be active and, and etch the gallium arsenide. Uh, sorry, the, <laughs> the graphene. <laughs> sorry about that. So here you see some pictures of graphene surfaces which are taken with the AFM, and depending on how far down you put it, the fewer of these hydrogen radicals result. And so here the holes are large and many, and these hexagonal holes get smaller and, and uh, uh, fewer of them as we're going further downstream. So we can use this remote plasma regime to actually, in a controlled way, uh, grow nanostructures. So the way we do this is we basically exfoliate graphene, we create some, uh, with uh, e-beam lithography, we create some pattern of intentional uh, holes or defects which we etch with a regular oxygen plasma and then we take the sample and expose it to the hydrogen plasma to now form this uh, hexagonal anisotropic type of etches that I've shown. So this works really well um, for bilayer, but somehow for single layer on silicon dioxide, we did not manage to reproduce this anisotropic etching. Somehow it becomes isotropic due to some eff eff uh, effect of the substrate. Maybe it has to do with the electric fields which are fluctuating very much. Maybe it has to do with the surface roughness. It's not clear. However, if we put it on hexagonal boron nitride, then this works very well. So now here again in a single layer graphene, you see this nice anisotropic hexagon. The circle in the middle is where we defined with E-beam the original hole with the oxygen plasma, and there is some sort of growth that's going on or some sort of process which gives these circles in the middle. It also works for bilayers. So this technique was actually developed, uh, was the well, it was discovered in the 70s, and it was kind of uh, developed for single-layer graphene a few years ago, and uh, it offers many uh, attractive uh, opportunities, but it's not so clear just how good the quality of these edges are. It's clear that these edges are running along the zigzag direction, but are these uh, basically crystallographically perfect edges, or are they still disordered, or how just how good are these edges is the question that I would like to answer in the next five minutes or so. So what we do is we do Raman spectroscopy with a spatially resolved uh, small you know, Raman uh, spot. And so uh, you know Raman spectroscopy maybe a little bit. There is this typical graphitic peak, a 2D peak, and then there is a peak from the HBN, and there is also a peak from disorder. So uh, it's I don't have time to explain in detail all the Raman processes, but it turns out that armchair edges give you a strong D peak, and the perfect zigzag edge is uh, not giving you any D peak at all. So if, if you're looking at the perfect zigzag edge and you don't see a D peak, it's a very strong indication that you have a very high quality edge. And that's the metric which we're going to use now to study these uh, hydrogen plasma remote defined uh, edge pits. So first we looked at uh, highly resolved AFM uh, pictures together in collaboration with uh, Ernst Meyer and this group. And we confirmed that, in fact, these edge pits are running along the zigzag direction, but for some reason it wasn't possible to actually get a shot exactly at the edge. So, so I cannot show you atomically resolved picture of the edge. And then on this is on graphite, where we first tried out this technique. Uh, there is absolutely no deep peak that we could measure. So we, we had many holes. We measured many of these Raman uh, spectra all over the sample to, to sample across many holes and there was just no deep peak. So on graphite we get actually very high quality zigzag 
uh, edges on these anisotropic edge pits. If you repeat this measurement now, this is uh, single layer graphene on HBN, you see again these hexagons, then we do this measurement and what we detect is actually a very clear and strong D peak which shows up. So this is obviously telling us already that these edges are not perfectly well-defined uh, zigzag edges. So here is a time series. We edge for two hours, then another two hours that gives us four hours, then maybe some annealing will make things better and uh, we can study all of that and look at the uh, uh, Raman spectroscopy. And it turns out surprisingly actually the original RIE edge that's done just with the conventional oxygen plasma gives the lowest D-peak and when we start uh, exposing this to the remote hydrogen plasma then the D-peak increases by almost a factor of two and kind of stays there and if we anneal at 700 degree it gets even worse. So, so the edge is uh, looking quite disordered. We have studied this at many different places. We've also looked at not only the intentional holes but also uh, uh, holes that just happen accidentally. Sometimes an ion still makes it on the sample and it knocks out one carbon atom and that acts as a seed for creating one of these holes. So these deep peaks are quite significant and strong and seem to be intrinsic to this plasma process. So what we did next is uh, uh, take linear polarized uh, light to study the direction dependence of the polarization from which one can actually learn quite a bit more about the type of disorder that one has in these edges. So, th so this is the D-peak intensity normalized by the G-peak intensity and we see a clear angle dependence here at, at with a maximum here around zero degrees which is defined in this way. And there is a nice theory that comes out of previous works, some of which are cited here, which tells us that we can have a zigzag edge at zero degrees, then some 60 degrees zigzag edge, armchair segments which can be showing up sporadically at 30 degrees and also point defects and the different terms here correspond to these different things. Note that overall the edge is still running in the zigzag direction but it's not a perfect zigzag edge, right? It could have defects or it could have armchair 30 degree segments and so on. And so from doing this fit actually it turns out that we have almost no uh, component of point defects but we have a lot of these armchair segments. The analysis gives us about 40% of the edge length is let's call it polluted by, by armchair segments. So with this analysis uh, we also did finally electronic measurements so we can etch ribbons. First we figure out which direction is the zigzag edge and then, uh, then we in this direction we define trenches to make kind of uh, nano ribbons which are a few hundred nanometers wide. You see here after exposing it to the plasma these shrink a little bit. This brighter part is the graphene. This is just where we etched before and then we can put the gate over it to form a PN junction and uh, to these side contacts. So this is now encapsulated graphene which has bottom and top uh, hexagonal boronitrite on it. So with this type of geometry you get the highest mobilities and we can try to analyze what we get electronically. So this is a signal of a typical PN junction. This is a top gate and back gate which we have here and actually if we look at this due to the finite size uh, states start bouncing and they form kind of a Fabry Perot and we see these oscillations which we can use to learn something about the length of the cavity which uh, I won't go into details here but uh, it turns out it's nicely consistent with the roughly 300 nanometer length of the gate. Now we can analyze this further and actually um, if we go to a large magnetic field then this regular oscillations turn into a more uh, kind of let's call it irregular conductance pattern and analyzing this actually it's quite interesting. Uh, if we look at the valley uh, degree of freedom here, depending on uh, how many uh, lattice cells we go across when crossing the ribbon, the edge state could either turn right or turn left as we're alternating the number of uh, unit cells along this way. So it either turns right or turns left and that alternates between a conductance of 2 e squared over h or 0 e squared over h. So we can actually use this type of effect to analyze also from the transport what the edge configuration is. So a perfect zigzag edge with the occasional step uh, on one of the edges will produce, this is shown in grain here, a conductance which is either 0 or 2 e squared over h. Whenever we go through one of these steps with the edge state it would change by 2 e squared over h plus or minus. An armchair edge would look quite different 
And if we add, so gray is for clean, no bulk disorder, and this uh, red traces are from the simulation with kind of the type of bulk disorder which we have in these, in these ribbons. And so a dis disordered zigzag edge would look like almost a constant, just weekly uh, uh, changing uh, conductance around 0 0.5. But that's not exactly what we see in the experiment. Uh, what we see in the experiment here is a cut is still quite some large uh, deviation from 0 0.5. And in fact, if we compare this with the simulation, this corresponds to um, an admixture of zigzag and armchair segments as shown here. And this gives qualitatively the same type of behavior. So this is also consistent with what we have found from the Raman spectroscopy. But this is now using uh, transport at low temperature to extract this. So in summary, um, we have used a remote hydrogen plasma to define uh, nanostructures, ribbons, and edges in graphene. And we have analyzed the quality of these edges. And what we find is that we get a significant fraction, around 40% of armchair segments, although almost no point defects. And so, uh, yeah, there is a bit of more work that would need to be done to actually create uh, perfect zigzag edges or, or better zigzag edges. In principle, this could also be done with a nitrogen plasma, and one could then define armchair edges. That should also work, but we haven't really worked in this direction. So with this, I stop, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks for the talk, Dominic. Uh, questions? So uh, how can you control the armchair or zigzag through nitrogen or uh, hydrogen? It's the chemical reactivity. So there is kind of a process cycle. Uh, ultimately, the chemical reaction on the edge, it forms methane with the hydrogen, and it forms some other molecule with the nitrogen. And uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure whether that's in understood in detail, but uh, it, it, it does give you the selectivity, uh, depending on what type of, whether it's w which gas is used. Do you see any sort of uh, gap opening from a size quantization or due to a Coulomb blockade, for example? As uh no, uh, these these ribbon 